respected padma shri professor ajay sood fellow of the royal society and principal scientific advisor dear to you all uh, of course his name is not uh, new to anyone and his complete introduction would itself take one full seminar so i will make it a short, short attempt to summarize it here all his vast achievements he holds two us and five indian patents he is known for his pioneering research uh, findings in graphene and nanotechnology he is a distinguished honorary professor of physics at the iisc bangalore the government of india honored him in 2013 with the padma shri and uh, he was elected fellow of the royal society uh, in 2015 Uh, Professor Sood has done extensive research on hard condensed uh, matter and soft condensed matter physics, with special emphasis on the Raman scattering and nanotechnology. Uh, he has been credited with many path-breaking findings and inventions. So, Professor Sood, through his experiments in 2003, uh, generated electrical signals by passing liquids over solids uh, through nanotubes, and his phenomena is now has been termed by the scientific world as the Sood effect. I can go on and on uh, with his achievements, but since the time is short, I will simply. I mentioned few honors and stop. To his credit, he has won Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, PWS Award, a G D Birla Science Award, a Baba Medal, M R S Medal, Millennium Gold Medal, Sir C V Raman Award, D A Raja Raman Award, Vigyan Ratan Award, R D Birla Award, etc. To name a few. I now request Padma Shri Professor Sud Faris to deliver his stop. So we give him to. Thank you very much. for this very kind introduction uh, i am truly honored and privileged to be giving this uh, memorial lecture in the name of a legendary figure uh, shri j r d tata i gave this talk a uh, j uh, r d tata memorial lecture probably in the same hall uh, around the same time 6 years back so when i got a letter from professor vaiya uh, on uh, january 15th this year uh, he wrote very clearly we remember you gave a talk but you were wearing different hat so with this new hat which you have we would like to hear you so without thinking much i said since it has come from tifr and you know tifr when something comes you can't refuse it's one of the most prestigious place with high intellectual atmosphere uh, very very intelligent people so i said we will uh, uh, worry about what to talk but i accepted that was in january and till me i kept on getting reminders from professor vaiya to give us a title of the talk and that was my problem because i had not made up my mind what to talk on so i had given a very uh, general title perspective on science for sustainable future that will cut across many areas i thought and i gave that title just to really stop getting the emails from professor vaiya about the title then a week or 10 days back when i started preparing it dawned on me that this is not something i can engage the intellectuals of the world for 45 to 50 minutes i can talk for maybe 15 minutes on that but uh, not really for 50 minutes without really uh, 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 testing your patience so i concocted this title on uh, almost uh, uh without thinking too much a personal scientific journey covering best of both worlds from vigyan to vigyan bhavan trust me i had not really thought about what i'll talk but i was very clear that i don't want to miss out on telling you something which is very exciting to us in the domain of science and take you to something which i do Uh, for ninety percent of my time now, and ten percent to fifteen percent, I am still plugged into science because I still have my graduate students in IIS Bangalore. So that is the genesis of this title, and uh, the reason I am here is because this invitation from TFR is so very special and prestigious. So I thought I'll share uh, both the sides. now this painting which you see here uh i'll show you a few of these paintings generated ai tool uh which we just generated two days back 
which you can use chat gpt4 or you can do this is done with dreamscape so i just gave a keyword journey of a scientist from science to policy so now you can use your imagination to see what it has created but there are many things <laughs> so i was amused so i thought i'll show this because in the evening you cannot be giving a very serious talk so i thought i'll amuse you on the way with some of these things so i thought <laughs> instead of talking one specific thing it gave me an opportunity to also see how my interest have evolved over a period of time and i uh, really there it is just a personal recollection and it is not meant for any uh, values or any value judgments and so on so this is a very personal journey which uh, i started in 1972 uh, uh, when i joined brc training school in uh, uh, bombay as was mentioned and uh, in 1974 i uh, opted in 73 i opted after completing the training school to move to material science lab in what was called reactor research center at that time and which was headed by as was mentioned uh, dr g venkatraman who was uh, uh, building up this group uh, in kalpakkam and when i reached there in uh, june 2020 in 1974 i was told to build an optics laboratory on materials that was the mandate that's it and i was 22 year old at that time and i had no uh, previous experience of building up a research group because i myself didn't have enough experience so we started thinking what to do so the uh, order came you build raman spectroscopy lab but without importing anything dr dr g venkatraman as you know all of you know him more than me some of you he was truly a nationalist and he didn't want to depend on imported equipments so reluctantly he agreed to buy a double grating monochromator and he says that's it so around that monochromator we build up the raman lab so i had to build along with my two young colleagues who joined me a year and two year later akhilesh and uma we started building helium neon and helium cadmium lasers of about 30 milliwatt and it was 1 and 1/2 meter long and with the gas filling system which was occupying the whole wall with about uh, 20 stop cocks which were leaky and so on so it was a struggle but in the end after 2 years 1 and 1/2 year of struggle we built those lasers we assembled raman spectrometer made cryostats and furnaces and electronics a single photon counting with the electronics group and we recorded our exp- uh, first spectrum around uh, 1978 or 79 78 so it took us 5 to 6 years 5 years almost to come to that stage and but we were not worried because in dia nobody ask you if your boss is happy that's the good point and uh, we thrived in that uh, but along in that 7 5 6 years we really devoted ourselves to learn physics because some uh, young people had joined and trained people uh, tra- very professional people like uh, professor v balakrishnan from tifr sushanta datta gupta dr sahu and all have joined so we learned some science physics from them and we measured the raman experiments and this is the very early experiment 42 years back we published on uh, potash alum which is potassium aluminum sulfate and look at raman spectrum and these two lines are the vibrational mode of a sulfate ion because the sulfate ions are in two inequivalent crystallographic orientation and the area ratio between them as a function of temperature did not follow arrhenius law that was thankful because if it was arrhenius it would have been boring physics because it was non trivial uh, we collaborated with prasad datta gupta uh, who uh, uh, was expert in stochastic uh, uh, relaxation dynamics 
and we and we all i we also learned uh, all the feynman diagrams because anharmonic contributions had to be added and we did publish it and uh, the lesson which i we learned at that time that designing and fabricating instruments is a integral part of research journey you can't separate it and data provided us opportunity to learn new theoretical tools like uh, stochastic theory of line shape continuous time random walk and uh, uh, phonon uh, and harmonic uh, interactions so that led to my uh, thesis in 1982 10 years after my masters uh named rotational and vibrational relaxation stochastic theory of line shape and continuous time random walk so this uh, thesis is 40% experiments and 60% theory so that also taught us a important lesson that there is no divide which is a very artificial in my mind between theory and experiment and the theorists should be able to appreciate experiment and experimentalists should know enough theory to look at, to ask the right questions so that was lucky but soon we realized after uh, they, uh, this uh, this was in 1982 that the the laser power which was only 20 to 30 milliwatt was not enough for raman scattering we needed much more power and we were limited so just that constraint that we could not import any argon ion laser that was prohibited we started looking at alternate physics which could be done with these lasers and that led us to soft condensed matter where we measured the structure factor s of q where q is the wave vector transfer and dynamic light scattering from the intensity intensity correlation from colloidal crystals and colloidal uh, suspensions so this was a lucky break which came out of constraints which uh, uh, were there because we did not have high power lasers and uh, 83 to 85 i had a very very fortunate uh, uh, position uh, lucky break to have post docs with professor cardona in max planck institute where we worked on variety of things and including semiconductor super lattices which were just getting discover uh, being studied at that time these are alternate layers of two uh, two semiconductors each layer is only about 20 angstrom so this is the nano science in the very beginning but it was called it was not called nano science at that time and that gave rise to very interesting physics which uh, i just give you an example so if when you have particle in a box this is the quantum mechanics 101 if they are confined in a box you have the quantization of the energy levels and the wave functions uh, uh, one, two, three, they have different parities, uh, odd and even parity. Question was, can you ask the same question for phonons instead of electrons? That was the question, which was not known at that time. We asked that question and we did Raman experiment and showed that instead of a very sharp line from gallium arsenide, which was the material of the super lattice with aluminium arsenide, we got large number of Raman modes depending on what symmetry we do. So we could separate odd and even uh, parity and we could map the phonon dispersion curve with Raman scattering, which is usually a zero wave vector uh, technique. And this was something which was very exciting that was published in 1985 and back to back, which has never happened, I understand in PRL. We had submitted two papers, four page each, and the second paper was on the interface phonon, which only exists at the boundary between the two semiconductors. And this was called interface phonons. And uh, of course, uh, then we had large number of uh, citations and so on. And then this field has thrived uh, from that time onward. So let me do a quick uh, fast forward. After coming back to Kalpakam in uh, June of 1985, we realized that Raman scattering cannot be done in Kalpakam at, at the level uh, which is happening internationally. So we focused more on soft matter, which has been most rewarding. And in uh, 1988, when I moved to ba uh, Bangalore, ISC Bangalore Physics Department, I was given two empty labs. 
there was no instruments and this was a contrast from a very uh, good lab in kalpakkam i decided to move and some people also called it a suicide mission which luckily i didn't listen to and uh, we uh, set up the lab and then from there we had raman lab Uh, uh also added high pressure because of professor j a j raman who spent a sabbatical in physics department and uh, then started brillouin scattering which is not written here in jnc started ultra fast uh, spectroscopy time resolved femtosecond spectroscopy in the next few years and uh, more recently time resolved second harmonic generation terahertz all that is just uh, so wonderful to learn new subject every 5 years and uh, uh, do nice experiments this is the uh, gift of gratitude of doing science in this country because you can afford to do all this uh, if, if the funding agencies are convinced and here i should place on record which i have done earlier also my special thanks to dr chidambaram uh, because after i shifted to isc you are given actually few rupees per year It, at that time it was 10000 rupees of course not few as a startup grant i got much more grant because uh, i uh, i said without that we can't start but it was not enough to start a full lab so i wrote to dst for a project on raman spectroscopy and dr chidambaram i don't know if you remember you was you were the rsc chair person and we had a discussion in the guest house that why can't you build the raman spectrometer in isc same question i then i had to explain that if that happens then again we will be nowhere so please allow me to buy a raman spectrometer and a argon ion laser and remaining things i'll build so luckily he had faith in me and dst gave me grants to build up the lab so it has been a nice uh, struggle along the way we have learned a lot and in the soft matter i started uh, getting interested in not only colloidal uh, crystals and so on but the systems based on surfactants and lipids that also brought me closer to some aspects of biophysics so and then we realized that if you have this soft matter you can shear them and this is a beautiful example of non equilibrium system. system and this is a whole field which is totally open from the physics point of view so we discovered in this uh, uh, surfactant systems that the viscosity depends very strongly on the shear rate that too in a very very well defined time manner which goes from a nice periodicity to a chaotic behavior so the entire physics of chaotic dynamics we could study experimentally in the sheared uh, uh, soft matter and more recently i'll cut the story short uh more recently the interest shifted to active matter and this is what i talked 6 uh, years back in this very hall where we looked at flocking behavior uh in this uh, active matter and uh, more recently in stochastic thermodynamics i i'll take few minutes to tell you what is so exciting about this which uh, made me give you the title from vigyan to vigyan bhavan so the next 15 minutes i'll tell you something we feel very excited we think it's a uh, something nice uh, it can be built upon and i'll just uh, share with you in a language which is not too technical so i have to keep track on time oh uh, so i don't know when did i start 5 445 445 okay so this is just sorry one example which i wanted to give on this uh, uh, time raman spectroscopy where we looked at uh, you know uh, nano devices uh, in in situ mode so this was the graphene field effect transistor when the device is working we see what are the changes in raman uh, signals so that raman became the eyes and ears of the nano device in situ and that gave us deep insight into the mechanisms which control the mobility of the carriers in nano devices so there is a interesting uh, anecdote here this paper we some so that time we were not making these devices these devices came from andre gains group who later got the nobel prize 
at that time we submitted this paper to physical review letters so it will be comforting for you to know that this paper was rejected it did not go to refereeing it said the editor said oh somebody has done on something uh, uh, you have done yourself a, a transistor in uh, carbon nanotube what are what is so new we said thank you very much we submitted the same paper with some uh, uh, changes to na nature nanotechnology which was uh, hugely uh, difficult we thought but we thought we should take a chance and luckily it went through without much trouble and good news is that now the data we generated on uh, looking at raman signatures as a function of n and p doping has now become a metrology tool and right now it has about more than 4000 citations because this is a uh, in the non destructive measurement of doping in a working device so what it led to that led uh, us that we must make this nano devices in isc believe me it was a struggle we wrote the projects we went to the director and said that we must have a clean room facility we should buy a we should have the fabrication where we can make this nano devices uh, with e beam lithography fortunately things were put together and we converted not we the group converted scanning electron microscope to e beam lithography and all our further experiments were done with isc made devices on graphene mos2 and so on so this is what i wanted to show that how it led to the entire new uh, development of this nano devices uh, fab fabrication in my group and many other groups in isc so let me now come to uh, in next uh, 10 minutes next uh, 15 minutes uh, what i want to tell you about stochastic thermodynamics so i have to take one step back and uh, remind you of your high school physics that we know that heat engines our life revolves around that the modern life cannot be uh, without uh, the use of heat engines and this converts heat or chemi chemical energy into mechanical work that is the general principle and uh, this is a wonderful milestone in the foundation of classical thermodynamics which was known the application of that came uh, in uh, by carnot in 1824 Uh, uh for this device for this heat engine so what do you have you have the first law of thermodynamics you know uh, first law of thermodynamics you can get the efficiency out you can know the carnot efficiency which is or very well known to you you combine first and second law of thermodynamics and you look at the heat engine entropy and so on so what do you have in the heat engine you have a hot source you have a cold source you have the gas so these are the two engines which are called carnot engine and stirling engine i'll just discuss the stirling engine in a uh, 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 little bit in uh, two minutes because that's what we'll be uh, using uh, in our next uh, discussion so what do you have in a stirling engine stirling engine you have a gas at a high temperature at uh, so the gas is in touch with the heat exchangers the it expands so that's where you get the useful work out this is the isothermal expansion so the uh, the system the engine and the heat exchangers are kept at high temperature uh, by the input of energy it could be from any source and that is where you get the useful work done if you are just uh, doing correctly at this stage you do a isochoric cooling which means you now Uh, so the uh, heat has been absorbed from the reservoir and gas has expanded you have done some useful work but you have to have a cyclic way because one cycle is not enough so you do at the same volume you just make sure that the gas is cold uh, connected to the cold reservoir at this time you do the compression where you work on the system and at this stage you get isochoric heating and uh, so the work is useful work is done here and if this work is much more than this you will get the useful work out that is the principle of stirling engine similar to uh, carnot but the efficiencies 
is less than uh, Carnot, which is what I have written here, work done and efficiency. And this is something very well known in the last uh, 250 years. And this has been, there are beautiful toy models also available in the market. But what you have to know for the last 250 years, that whatever we have discussed is in the reversible limit, which means you do very, very slow work. So everything is extremely slow so that you always have equilibrium between reservoir and the uh, uh, engine because otherwise, then only you get the complete work done. So this is called the cycle time, how much it takes this and that gives you the maximum work done at a large tau which is written uh, work done. So you would like to have very, very slow engine so that you get a lot of work done and efficiency is also maximum. As you make the engine faster, means uh, small cycle time, you have a problem with demand and supply. It cannot do at such a rate and the work done will decrease and at some time, it will not be an engine, it will be a refrigerator because it will not respond and efficiency will also become uh, less than zero. So what happens is you would like to be in this sweet spot. But the trouble is, life is not so simple. The, at that time, if you look at what is the useful power, because you need power, that's why you are making an engine. You have to do the, uh, you, what is the power you can drive from this engine? The power will be exactly zero asymptotically, because power is work done uh, divided by the cycle time. And for large tau, the power is extremely small. At smaller tau, power is extremely small because it has already not responding. So there is an optimum value of cycle time where the power is maximum, but efficiency is not, uh, 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 efficiency you have to live with it. This is called uh, curzon album efficiency. This is true for all engines made so far. All the engines, whether it is a nuclear reactor, thermal reactor, everything, is some variation of that and you live with curzon album efficiency and not the Carnot efficiency. Carnot efficiency is more, much more than this. So this is a paradigm. It's called power efficiency trade-off in macroscopic engines. So you have to sacrifice something to get out. So what have you sacrificed? You have sacrificed efficiency to get the maximum power, which is what you want to utilize uh, for your use. So at fast cycle time, as I told you, you bring irreversibility into engine performance. I want you to keep that in mind. I'll come back on uh, how we started. So, uh, so uh, now the goal in the entire uh, community is to miniaturize the uh, engines. Why do you want to miniaturize? Uh, at nanoscale, if you can uh, make it, can you do transport cargo inside cell? Of course, very, very fascinating science fiction question right now. And can you really basically understand this field? Why do you need to do that? The reason is when you have nano means very, very few particles of gas, very, very few, not 10 to the power 23 per unit uh, volume, but very few in a nano system. Engine is in nano size. Your performance will depend strongly on the environment because the uh, energies are uh, somewhat similar. And the fluctuations, when you have very small particles, the huge fluctuation, you will not really work with the average quantities. Average, are, average is same as the uh, variance. This is the problem of small system. So it is not a mechanical miniaturization, which is a challenge. The challenge is you have to work with fluctuating thermodynamic quantities. That fluctuations, how do you get heat uh, and work calculate is the whole paradigm of stochastic thermodynamics. It is thermodynamics with fluctuating quantities. And the heat to work in fluctuation dominated regime, regime is the new uh, uh, fever in this field to see how do you make such stochastic thermodynamics work for you? How do you make practical systems? And that practical system was demonstrated um, a few years back in 2012 by a German group with a very, very clever technique. So what they did, piston and a cylinder were replaced 
by a optical tweezer which confine only one colloidal particle please remember it's in water colloids are moving you trap a colloidal particle that trap acts like a piston and a cylinder so by by changing the stiffness of the potential you can make the uh, you can expand or control in a very very precise manner so the piston moving out is reducing the laser power and so on so the beauty is you can now make an engine with one colloidal particle and not 10 to the power 23 that is the achievement of this paper so the colloidal particles are in water so when you change the water temperature let's say from 70 degree centigrade to room temperature these are the t hot and t cold you get the work done and they demonstrated that whatever you get so what you measure is the particle displacement uh, in time and you get the probability distribution that's all you have from probability distribution of p of uh, x now there is a stochastic thermodynamics framework which has been done this is just a setup optical tweezer it's a very straight forward uh, i'm sure in tif or many groups are using which is a wonderful tool in biological science you focus the laser in a, a microscope and this is where you trap a colloidal particle and you can move around like a tweezer so i will not uh, go over the equations but once you know the probability distribution you can really get all the heat and work done and what it was found in 2012 that when you operate between the thermal baths at 70 degree or 80 degree centigrade and room temperature whatever you measure the uh, work done efficiency and power they exactly match what you calculate for macroscopic engines so the microscopic engine gives you the macroscopic thing when you work with this thermal reservoir at that time we came into picture and we were thinking of stochastic thermodynamics from other uh, problems and we said what happens if the bath themselves are out of equilibrium it's not a thermal bath it's a non equilibrium reservoir there is no macroscopic equivalent there is no nothing like environment which you can play with and you can say that i'll make it uh, uh, thermal or non thermal and this is where we wanted to see now in these engines please keep one thing in mind these are not the ones which i will run tomorrow and give you the useful work and run something in my body it is still far from that but it opens up a huge paradigm this is the beginning of the game which establishes fundamental principles that govern the motion of motors biological motors at micro scale so this is where the understanding has to be evolved and non equilibrium reservoir is this is where the biology also works how do we do that this is what we did in 2016 in this work uh, we very so in uh, in addition to the colloidal particle we also put bacteria into it and the temperature of that whole bath by another channel we varied between simply 313 kelvin little bit feverish and 290 kelvin at 313 bacteria are very very agitated very agitated they really move around bacteria is not trapped trapping is still one single colloidal particle but at 290 they do not die but they are very sluggish so these bacteria i will not give you detail this is something i touched upon in my last uh, talk here which was the beginning of the these experiments and what we showed was that indeed that uh, uh, probability distribution very enormously changes when you do instead of now isothermal we are doing isoactivity high activity it is like a high effective temperature then you have a uh, cooling of water which means bacteria cool down at low activity then again uh, heating and this thing this if the bacteria was not there the <clears throat> engine will give you very very small work which i'll show you and small efficiency but using this bacterial activity to get in high effective temperature what we uh, uh, how do we define it because you have to define some bacterial activity probability distribution is highly non gaussian using this variance the line, the width of this we can simply equate to kbt this t 
is not the temperature of the reservoir it is the effective temperature seen by the colloidal particle because bacteria are putting all this noise and that noise is getting converted into uh, this heat and this is what we did at that time and we showed that the thermal uh, the without the bacteria this was the cumulative work done very very small on this scale expanded here minus 3 in this unit but when we put this uh, very bacteria between this uh, uh, low and high activity you can see that it increases 250 times so we can now use the bacterial activity to make it a non equilibrium reservoir and we showed that indeed you can do many many t activity various activities of bacteria and we showed at that time that the work done uh, the useful work done which is negative by convention without bacteria it's very very small 0.03 and that becomes huge as you increase the activity dip, uh, temperature difference and this is something which is uh, has not been shown and we show it can be done with non equilibrium reservoir and the efficiency which is here without bacteria it jumps and you can see that it even crosses the theoretical limit for this system which is what is known the stirling uh, efficiency which is what is given here it even exceeds that it should not be surprising because we are in a non equilibrium system so there is no reason to believe that the equilibrium physics prediction will go through this is something i thought i'll uh, tell you and this is the work which we did in collaboration with our biology colleagues which i mentioned uh, 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 professor Chatter, uh, dipankar chatterjee and his student who gave us the right kind of bacteria and the graduate student sudesh this is the work in his thesis uh, which he submitted uh, 2019 and it has still taken us another year and a half to do the last part which i'll tell you uh, in next few minutes so it's uh, and my long term collaborator very very active collaboration with professor rajesh ganpati who is in gnc and his student nilendu rai so it has been truly a collaborative work wonderful uh, experience because these experiments please trust me extraordinarily difficult because you have to trap a particle and do this cycling without uh, any artifact so it takes uh, enormous amount of patience and work and hats off to sudesh and uh, more recently nilendu uh, in gnc who are able to perform these experiments so uh, this is the paper i discussed and more recently we have done two engines uh, coupled what happens then if you have two coupled engines in equilibrium nothing will happen it will be just additive but now when you have two non equilibrium systems you can really do synergy and what we showed that you can do synergistic action in coupled uh, engines uh, due to some non conservative flows uh, this appeared actually it's 23 sorry it appeared beginning of the year and uh, more recently uh in professor rajesh ganpati's lab in nilendu they have a very very unique system to vary the effective temperature no bacteria nothing what do you do in addition to the uh, uh, laser which is trapping this colloidal particle you have another laser which fluctuates uh, randomly around this axis so this creates noise and what we have shown is it can give you effective temperature as high as uh, 2000 kelvin but the water temperature is a thermometer is still 300 kelvin so there are many ways to manipulate reservoir so we call it reservoir engineering we did reservoir engineering using bacteria we are doing reservoir engineering using coupled particles and this one reservoir engineering using photon so we call it photon phantom so there is a photon phantom which you can play with and get any statistics statistical property of the reservoir and uh, uh, so today i'll only talk on this work which is uh, under final round and more recently the reservoir now has been uh, uh, replaced instead of water we have replaced with a visco elastic gel this is our old love you know the surface love never dies so you have to keep on nurturing it uh, nurturing it so here what we show is 
even at small time the power and the efficiency and the work doesn't go down because the elasticity of the gel uh, helps to restore reversibility which is what i will not talk it's in the final round so i will only give you the key results of this so that uh, i'll tell you why we are excited this is the paradigm which has not been broken for the last 250 years it is a paradigm that you have to sacrifice uh, 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 efficiency to get the maximum power this happens because in quasi static limit why do you get this because if the cycle time is much much more than any relaxation time because there is a finite time when the engine and the reservoir will exchange heat right because due to thermal conductivity in macroscopic system as long as this is satisfied you will have the quasi static limit in the last bacterial experiment our cycle time was 22 seconds theoretically it has been shown uh, very uh, recently in the last 4 uh, 5 years you can violate this trade off with very exotic constructs uh, i can't tell you how exotic they are because none of them can be implemented in experiments so there is a beautiful theory framework where they bring out the key point i'll just give you the key point because that's the heart of the uh, uh, these uh, theoretical attempts almost 10 of them if you can manipulate engine which is the uh, what you said uh, your particle trap and the reservoir if you can bring their interaction under control they need not they should not be independent of each other if you can uh, couple them theoretically it has been shown you can manu- you can uh, look at the breakdown of this trade off but nobody knows how do we do this uh, experimentally so what we thought is what i'll tell you uh, i will not come to this what we will do is what we did now we don't vary the temperature of the water the way by uh, heating and cooling you put a electrode uh, around the trap where you apply white noise voltage voltage is applied is a electrophoretic mechanism and it is applied randomly it's a white noise so it's a 2 kilohertz voltage varying plus uh, 0.5 volt to minus 0.5 volt and uh, if you uh, write so, solve the langevin equation which is done in this 2016 uh, heat engine paper on the brown, uh, brownian carnot engine the t effective gets enhanced not the normal temperature of the bath but also something which depends on the strength of the noise uh, this is the electrophoretic noise this is the noise on the capacitor now you have a way to control the uh, t- effective temperature of this so this is the experiment we do uh, you have put two copper electrodes very close uh, and this is where the colloidal particle are trapped in a tweezer do the protocol i will not go into detail but the beauty is why it is so uh, brings the interaction the reason is when you do this electrical volt uh, voltage you get the ions which are uh, surround the colloidal particle so you have a ion cloud which you have to take care that relaxation has a time scale which is of the order of 4 to 5 millisecond and that time scale is now very important in this whole business so without giving you all the reasoning for it which you can control we showed that for a given voltage fixed voltage the temperature you will get will not be independent this is independent if it is a very stiff uh, 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 trap but if the trap is soft then the effective temperature depends on the k this is exactly the system bath interaction k is your uh, decide the hamiltonian of the system that is the engine and t effective is your bath so here you have a coupling because of electrophoretic noise let me give you the detail last so this is the final result without worrying about the you look at the work done the tight to cycle very large 50 seconds you have what you call theoretical limit of the stirling engine and as you come down it is coming down this is the theoretical expectation but now moment you cross this 100 millisecond 
instead of becoming negative zero uh, it's crossing this it starts going up you can see the number of data points and you have a finite work when the engine is moving very very fast and we could go up to 10 millisecond of the cycle time efficiency if you plot which is the work done divided by the heat input q uh, hot you can see this is what is the normal expectation decrease but now here actually because the tau is becoming small it exceeds even the carnot limit or it reaches the not exceed uh, reaches the carnot limit so here you have a situation at small cycle time which is what you would like ideally you want to have fast engine instead of becoming uh, stalled instead of not working it is giving you a large efficiency and la and uh, uh, finite work done and if you plot efficiency and power on the same thing it's completely violated so this is the one where the violation is not there up to this as expected but this regime is totally totally new so we have now very large power at small tau that is fine also we have large efficiency so this trade off is broken how did we break it let me remind i and the, how does the stirling cycle look in t and t, k is like volume this is the beautiful stirling cycle uh, for 550 second no surprise but when you start playing with the tau so it is small it is highly distorted and at the, this can explain uh, all this and uh, we can show that this is totally broken so the moral of the story is theoretically uh, it is uh, it was predicted that bath and system you cannot have independent one can you if you can bring uh, coupling which is a million dollar billion dollar question for macroscopic heat engine we do not know how it will happen but in mesoscopic heat engines you can do that and what we have shown is maximum efficiency can be reached in finite time for irreversible engines by tailoring engine bath interaction and this can be broken for microscopic system so that's why we feel very excited that this whole paradigm which is there for last 250 years can be broken for this nano heat engine and experimentally demonstrated now okay 10 minutes right uh i will now tell you the second part of my uh, title of my talk and i moved to delhi on 25th april uh, uh in office of psa and this is where the vigyan bhavan comes because psa office is in vigyan bhavan mx and uh, i uh, as you know dr chidambaram was the second psa for 16 years the uh, first psa was uh, uh, dr abdul kalam and the third psa was dr professor vijay raghavan again uh, tifr connection dai connection and uh, 25th april i took over in vigyan bhavan annex and this is the vigyan bhavan annex and our office is somewhere there and uh, so again this art which i said ai tool just to amuse you this is what it tells you that if uh, what is the image of this generative ai which it will generate just to uh, amuse you now i'll just take few minutes to introduce you to what this office does or expected to do uh, so our uh, the aim of this office is to provide pragmatic and objective advice to the prime minister and cabinet on matters related to science technology and innovation this is the broad mandate and if you look at more carefully it covers all aspects it enabling future preparedness in emerging domains of science and technology fostering effective public private linkages which is again very critical as we will discuss later uh, for driving research and innovation and snt fundamentals with applied research in collaboration with multi stakeholders both in central and state and driving innovation and technology delivery towards solving socio economic challenges for sustainable growth providing an enabling ecosystem for technology led innovations and formulating and coordinating major interministerial snt mission 
so we do not come under any science ministry we are uh, ministry agnostic and that's why we can work with all the departments be it uh, civil aviation be it mnre be it dot mighty and of course the science department so it spans across all the snt sectors we have two arms in this and this is one is called the prime minister's science technology innovation advisory council which has six members uh, and uh, this is to develop a futuristic road map for science and technology and advise the prime minister and the second one equally important is called empowered technology group and this is to oversee national level policies related to procurement and induction uh, facilitate r and d and timely advice and all that for technology development programs for example the drone policy how can be done uh, what has to be done and so on so this comes under technology uh, empowered technology group so the idea here is that you need interdependencies of uh, fundamental science you need uh, technology uh, innovations including business models and enabling technology to do all these technologies which country needs and that is the uh, whole paradigm of uh, taking country forward in a technologically competitive manner now there are many many technologies one cannot really just uh, say one or two this is just a snapshot of something which you come across uh, in daily life the uh, we have immediately the quantum frontiers to handle we have advanced communication technologies like 6g we have a digital transformation in which india has done extremely well uh, probably the best in the world and artificial intelligence clean energy is a uh, something which we cannot ignore and one health mission is what we started last year to re- uh, learning from the covid experience so what do we have in pm strike in the last 4 years Uh, uh what we have is many missions which have been launched so we have a uh, deep ocean mission launched ministry of earth science uh, leads it so office of psa does not lead any mission we do not implement any mission we are more in the advisory role before the mission is launched working out all the uh, domains and also make sure that it runs when it is launched so we have that role national uh, natural language uh, mission artificial intelligence by mighty waste to wealth which is run by our office accelerating growth uh, of new india innovation agni by our office uh, uh, again mobility mission under that the green hydrogen mission has been launched by mnre and more recently uh, quantum mission was launched as you know very recently uh, uh, by the country which is led by dst with another six departments joining and more and very recently we are working to launch one health mission which will be uh, seared uh, with about 11 ministries but the lead ministry will be icmr and uh, another mission which is in the making or we have to work on it is called national livelihood mission where the smt go uh, uh, outputs outcomes can be really taken to masses in uh, uh, less privileged uh, societies in uh, villages and so on how it can be done so this is a broad theme and more recently for example to give you an idea on july 25th we had the technology advisory group meeting and we looked at alternate battery technologies which country should focus on carbon capture utilization and storage what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses and artificial intelligence is a huge thing and a task force is being created as we speak to really take it fast forward with responsibility because generative ai as you know has other side of it so you have to now integrate and balance the usefulness as well as the uh, uh, risks of this so i don't think i have too much time but what i'll do is i'll just give you one or two examples of one health mission for example which is uh, we all know that human health animal husbandry and wildlife they are all interconnected and diseases are going across the uh, three uh, three sectors and we cannot take them separately 
तो वन हेल्थ मिशन इज रियली टू लुक एट द फ्यूचर पेंडेमिक प्रिपेयरनेस बाय इन्वॉल्विंग ऑलमोस्ट इलेवन मिनिस्ट्रीज एंड स्टेट गवर्नमेंट तो हियर द आइडिया इज ऑल द मिनिस्ट्रीज आर डूइंग समथिंग और द अदर इन वन हेल्थ but there are lots of technology gaps so this mission will look to plug those technology gaps and uh, uh, make us future uh, 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 ready for the future pandemics so th- there are lots of players i will not read it there uh, there are two levels of uh, high power committees various uh, private sectors ngos academic institutes international partners are there and this is what is now going to the cabinet uh, sometime soon a um, lot of technology needs we have identified in the mission what uh, you need for uh, surveillance what you need for vaccines what you need for data digit uh, uh, disease modeling and so on so uh, this is a whole some picture which is evolving and the most recent mission is the quantum mission and uh, tifr is doing extraordinary well as a leader in quantum domain i had this uh, another meeting uh, two hours back with the players here there is no question that you need quantum technologies it has four uh, uh, aspects quantum computing quantum communication quantum sensing and quantum materials and devices feeding into all these three they are not all four independent they are interdependent and the mission Uh, which is launched uh, and will be uh, uh, managed by dst will look at all four verticals so this is something which is evolving it has been announced but now all the committees and all that and the structure is being made i will not uh, spend time this is something world wise it is happening we have started it and it will take us uh, a lot of effort in a short time to really see that we don't lag behind this and we have to have quantum safe world it is a reality it's not a question whether we should do it it is a question how do we do it soon that's the question we have to ask uh, and luckily the nobel prize in 2020 is again on quantum technologies i will not give all the quantum uh, this 101 on quantum mechanics and why quantum uh, the second revolution in quantum mechanics is happening but what i want to show that this settles the debate once for all this artificial divide between basic science and usefulness so this famous uh, plot which you would have seen million times what it plots is whether it's a fundamental understanding and consideration of use this sector is called the pure basic research bohr sector this is called pure applied research addison center and when you have both these high it's called use inspired basic research uh, which uh, dr chidambaram also called directed research or whatever names and this is the posture so this is what but what you want to remember is that in this plot time is not there what you have to remember is the beginning can be the basic science but then it will become the most useful thing and quantum technology is a case in point other case in point of course is gps which depends on general theory of relativity cryptology and so on i don't have to tell this audience you are more uh, familiar with than me i will not give all this talk on green hydrogen which is a mission i will say that enormous work has been done in the last 6 uh, months and we have come out with a r&d road map and this is there as we speak on mnre website inviting comments from scientists and all the stakeholders if we are missed out and very soon this will be r and d road map will be implemented in the country this is where we have played a big role and last initiative is what we do uh, in uh, um, so i'll take only one mission uh, one platform called manthan platform which is launched so what we have done so project manthan was launched on 15th august last year 2022 it's less than a year it's about 11 months in 11, the idea is that you have people who demand a uh, solutions they say we must have the solution in the country uh, what scientists are doing what are you doing what is the mechanism 
if industry wants to ask a question, NGOs want to ask, embassies want to ask, philanthropists want to solve a problem like uh, uh, foundations, public sectors, MSMEs, and so on. These people have the problem statement or their intention to really get the solution. Now, they will go to various uh, uh, supply side, which is R&D, our academic institutes, our uh, startups, various people, uh, academic sector, national labs, they will say that, look, we can uh, work for you uh, in a way which is mutually beneficial. So we have demand and supply side on this platform. It's a very, very uh, transparent and democratized platform. And we have large number of opportunity providers who are willing to fund R&D, even basic, as well as applied on given problem statements. So we have 254 opportunity providers, which means funders on this platform. And 175 industries have been engaged. A lot of central ministries have been engaged. And in the last 11 months, 2690 crores have been finalized with these uh, things. Most of them are finalized. Some are in the final stages. And total number of central ministries, which are the opportunities, are 25. So central ministries like Ministry of Jal Shakti, uh, Mighty, they have put problem statement on this platform. So I urge you to go to that platform and see if you would like to contribute to the national priorities as well as otherwise. So a large number of uh, STI clusters, which also comes under our office, six of them have been uh, done. I will not, these are some examples where the funding as high as 68 crores have been given to center of excellence on this energy. So it's a very, very wonderful platform where we can do this matchmaking and see how really we can use our ecosystem to really solve the problems. And this is the attempt by Office of PSA. I will not give you on the clusters. And last one, which you might be curious, is the NRF, which is another uh, big, big uh, opportunity where again, Office of PSA has played a uh, role. And again, here, we need to bring collaborations between institutes, institute and industry, institute and national labs, uh, universities. And we need to go to a tier two and tier three uh, academic institutes. We have to have partnerships, which we have written in the uh, bill. We have uh, professorships, which can be taken in the smaller universities and so on funding. So this is something evolving. So let me close this. Why do we collaborate and do science? without borders, which means you really don't have to think of physics, chemistry, biology. We have complex problems which may not be uh, for single discipline and discoveries usually happen on the borderline and we need to collaborate with each other for this. So thank you once again. i sorry if I took more time, but this is something I thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sood, for such an interesting and uh, wonderful uh, talk. Uh, and now, talk is open for questions and comments. Uh, due to this time constraint, we can only take one or two maximum questions. Yes, uh, Sandeep? Yes. Uh, can you provide? Uh, hello, Dr. Sood. So this mantra seems like a great idea of kind of people listing down their problems and then scientists with their skills trying to match, match the two. Any successes you can report? How is it working out so far? Anything else? So you can do? already some projects in 11 months, it's not too long, have been closed with some deliverables. But many of them are halfway. So already 2,600 crores have been committed. A lot of it has been released. And the outcomes will start coming in next few months. But some of them which are already almost close to that, 
uh, we do not control that. We will not be able to control that. We are not policing a project. No, that is outside our expertise and outside our uh, uh, even the bandwidth of our office. So we will not have that. It's a very very wonderful uh, team uh, strategic alliance division. You can go to the PSA website and you can see what are the open challenges at a given time. Every uh, few days or month, I guess, or few weeks, new challenges are posted. Uh, by the people who are giving the opportunities, and they cover uh, R and D, they cover the uh, missions, everything, center of excellence, everything. Govindu, uh, the mic is with me. <laughs> I'll take the question, uh, Professor Sud. I'm. I have a question about uh, out here in the middle, straight ahead. Uh, I had a question about your uh, work on this. Uh, non equilibrium baths uh, in some of the examples you showed that you are actually creating this non equilibrium bath by applying these voltages or this fluctuating ledges uh, does one have to worry about the energy requirements of create for creating those non equilibrium baths and to be factored into the no, overall we don't factor that okay the factoring is what is the work output of the engine and how much heat is transferred through this fluctuation to the engine okay how the you know, reservoir is engineered that is not even in the definition of carnot and stirling cycle i see it's not there okay so that's the way thermodynamics is defined okay all right thanks yeah so gobindo last question yeah so this is not what you talked in this here but this is come from your office that mega science vision 35 how seriously we can consider that how serious i can we can consider that what went from the let's say up the mega science vision 35 from your office so some many feedback was taken from us yes and we have given some feedback correct and how so i i think somebody asked me this at lunch time i don't know who asked me uh, yes so uh, the first uh, on the nuclear physics uh, it has been submitted and i gave the response that we need to find somebody who can hand hold this that's the brief as i mentioned repeatedly office of psa does not run any mission no we facilitate that and make sure that whatever we can do uh, that there is a taker who is convinced that we have done all the homework and take it forward so my question is that uh, how much you can influence the minister that if something was not a probably... public question sorry <laughs> no sorry no, not a I public question no i don't know the answer thank you okay uh, yeah okay so uh, i think uh, because of uh, we are already pressed for time uh, we will uh, stop this uh, question and answer he will be available during the tea time uh, so let me uh, thank professor prabhu uh, shri professor sud for coming here all the way and giving such a wonderful and engrossing uh, talk uh, engaging us all uh, and uh, now just as a formality i have to uh, thank uh, all the people so it's my pleasure and privilege to thank all the people who made this possible so we wish to express our gratitude to the director tifr and the entire administration of tifr for their enthusiastic support as we thank the speaker respected padmashri professor ajay sud frs for his wonderful lecture covering several decades of his adventure in vidyan and we must have been, it must have been an herculean task summarize it in such a, a short time and so we wish to thank mr kishor medan ms snehal savan central services auditorium gardening canteen trans for security pro office and the registrar's office uh, so we hope to see you again next year and take care and have a nice and wonderful evening thank you very much